give you leaders as a vocation, those who work within the movement for the good of the Corsilio need to see their work as a calling, as a primary apostolate. Hindi yung nag-alala kayo ng apo, ha? This is a prime apostolate, first and foremost, before other things. It should not be the same response as we might have to on our hobbies, when I want, when I have time, or because it gives me pleasure. Well, we all know that vocation is not just for the ordained, right? And sometimes we, we, we hear this vocation, oh, this vocation is a priesthood, or the diaconate, or the religious you know, order and stuff like that. Because vocation is a calling to love and serve God and one another. So, as married people, with your wives and your husband, that is a vocation. We all know that, right? Even single people. Sino ba ba single dito? Single life is still a vocation. Because single life to live God's plan for oneself and for others is a vocation. Now sometimes it turns out to be a vacation. <laughs> That's why when I want it, and I have time, or because I want it. So there's a difference between a vocation and a vacation. Okay, we're, not, we're not on a vacation here when we are serving the Lord. Church leader. As church leaders, as Corsino leaders, we must speak the gospel, not ourselves. We are to be ministers of the word, not masters of the word. As ministers, we are servants of the Lord and servants to one another. A Corsini leader or a church leader must constantly be open to conversion and renewal. So always open to changes. One example I can think of right now is we just had the uh, new translation of the Roman Missal, right? That we started in the first Sunday of Advent. Tell me the truth. Who among you doesn't like it? Just, you know, be honest about it. Everybody likes it, really? Are you sure? Right? Oh, come on, you know. Let me, let me tell you the truth. Well, yeah, because even, even priests, even the clergy, and Father Leo shared this with me when he went to the convocation. He said about, my numbers might be wrong, I would turn around or something, about 30% of those who attended the, the convocation didn't like it. You know, I'm not going to name names, even in my own deanery, we have a parish, a pastor, you know, we didn't want to implement it, but he's, he's forced to implement it, right? So, you know, you could be a clergy, you could be an ordained, unordained, um, still, you could have this closed mind because of changes. People don't want changes, right? You know, we've been doing this so many years, we already memorized the creed, we already memorized the confidio, or, you know, I confess Almighty God and all those things, the Gloria, and then now it's changed, right? So, you know, these are the kind of things. That's why sometimes, you know, when we say in our um, serving God, we're so committed, you probably heard this already before, you're so committed to serving God, it's already considered some of this, I think you consider the only pure speaking Corsilistas in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I know, so my, but I know Sister Corey has uh, taught him well. <laughs> they're so committed that their way of thinking is committed now. <laughs> they became narrow. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that from Father Frisco, right? <laughs> right? They committed now. It's like, it's like those, the horses, you know, the, the horse, you notice they have these blinders in here, right? That the reason why they have that is so that way when, when you're directing them, they're not distracted, right? And sometimes we have those blinders, okay? We, we don't want change. So, this is not part of my talk, actually. I'm just <laughs> adding on to it. <laughs> so, instead of committed, you must be admitted, okay? Developing our own formation. Corsillo leaders need to know ourselves better. We need to make special effort or efforts to deepen our commitment that we may be truly formed and continue that formation. We are a pilgrim people always in process, always growing. So 
developing our own formation, we must continue our formation scripturally, <laughs> prayerfully, and apostolically. <laughs> we must develop that intimate union through prayer. Meditative, reflective, contemplative, and a speak, listening, responding type of prayer. You know, I'm not putting down prayer groups here or anything, but sometimes, you know, we, we tend to have a prayer group that, you know, uh, just pray the rosary and just mechanically and not even understanding what they're saying. You know, it becomes a practice sometimes. It's not a speaking, listening, praying anymore. Responding type of prayer. Formation must be rooted also in scripture, um, in the Vatican II uh, documents. For example, like Pope Paul's Evangelii Nuntiandi, which is Paul, uh, Pope Paul VI's exhortation on evangelism and affirms the role of every Christian, not only ordained in spreading Catholic faith. Also, we need to be more aware about the Cursilio literature and other spiritual reading. Now, I know um, you can see our uh, Cursilio manual and everything still under revision, or is it pretty much final? Wait, which manual do you need? The, uh, the leader's manual? No, the leader's manual is not being... Yeah, it's, yeah. it's only the, uh, the weekend manual and all those things. Right? Yeah, no, yeah, the, weekend, the official yeah. weekend manuals, there are the yeah. weekend manual, I guess it's still... There still is. Okay. Well, no, we it will be. It will, will be, yeah. because I know we were, we were working on that the last meeting that we had. See, th those are the kind of things that as far as conciliar literature I'm talking about is you have to research for yourselves what this literature are and be aware of them. You know, don't, don't just um, rely, of course, on Deacon Steve. I'm sure Deacon Steve is going to give a spiritual direction that you have spiritual advisors uh, in the Corsillo that is available for that. But you also need to do your own research on those. Okay. See, that's, that's one of the things growing up back home. Remember how we were told not to even go in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Remember that? We had Bibles at home? No. We were not even told that? Uh, I just, when I was <laughs> growing, that's what I was told. Because they, they're afraid that if I open it and read it and interpret it myself, then I became uh, a born again. Or born again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> born you know, those kind of things, right? You know, the, the Anglicans and, and all kinds of things. So, but the thing now is, you know, we, we have this awareness of all this literature that's available to us and we have all the mentors and the spiritual advisor that's available to help us. And finally, developing a lay spirituality. In chapter 4 of the Constitution of the Church, it says, we are all called there to live in the world and be part of it by God so that by exercising our proper function and being led by the spirit of the gospel, we can work for the sanctification of the world from within in a manner of living. In this way we can make Christ known to others, especially by the testimony of a life resplendent in faith, hope, and charity. Like I said, these other items are not part of my talk, so I'm not going to expand too much about them. But, each of us has our own calling in the development of our spirituality. Our holiness is not really how much we pray nor is it how much we know about God, and it's not how much we do. Our holiness is the fusion of our sacramental life, our participation, our celebration of liturgies, the Eucharist, reconciliation, fused with the work we do, the choices we make in the world, in the family, the neighborhood, our work, and the community. We can Ray, on his summary, such a, lot, a little bit about this. That's why when he was giving a summary, I was afraid, oh, he's giving my talk already. <laughs> 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 you know. But, you know, it's very true, you know, especially the Eucharist, which is the sum and summit of our Christian life. I always say that if, if you look at our website for St. Catherine, www.sbcmtc.org, you don't have to remember that, on, on, our, on, our, on my bio in there, I did say, because, you know, it asked you about, like, what really drew me into becoming a deacon in my diaconate was the liturgy, the Eucharist, the liturgy of the Eucharist. Growing up, you know, I've always been um, dragged by my mom 
you know, like my mother is a churchgoer. Monday she goes to um, not St. Anthony, but another church. But anyway, Tuesday she goes to St. Anthony. Wednesday she goes to Baclaran. Thursday she goes to St. Jude. Friday she goes to Piaco. I mean, all this thing, and, and she always drags me along. You know, I'm from a small boy. I was only maybe three or four years old, as far as I can remember. And so I'm always exposed to the Eucharist from a younger age. And thinking about, like, you know, where they say in here, um, who among you have churches or, or uh, worship space where there's like a um, cry room or a children's room? They're, they're separated. You know, I'm not really up for that. I know it's it's uh, inconvenient sometimes, or you know, because other people are distracted from their worship because of the noise. But actually, if you think about it, if they're always with you, and if they're just properly trained at home where they can behave, I know the children will be children and they'll make noise. And there's nothing you can do about that. But they are they are with you inside, and they know what's going on. I mean, it's nice if you're in a, um, an architecture where they can actually see what's happening. But sometimes, you know, they're in a separate room where they can hardly see what's happening, especially when they're over the back. So it doesn't expose them at an early age. And sometimes, you know, it's not till like maybe they're 10 or 11 years old when they're dragged into the church and all those things. But, you know, those are the type of conveniences that sometimes um, we, don't, we don't want to bother people. And that's what happens. You might agree with me or disagree with me, but that's just my own take on that. So, our spirituality is the total integration of who and what and how we do things. Our spirituality must be our life. Our spirituality must be authentic and observable. In short, a corsillo leader must be more of everything that a corsillista should be. Sounds familiar? Yes. Was it other? Marines. Marine. Yeah. Be that all you can be, right? You've seen this before. Okay, I might just share with you some of the um, excerpts that I got from the manual that was emailed to me by Sister Penny. All right, I, I'd like to cover it, so she gave this to me, so I might as well use it. Right. Well, it says here, our need for formation must be rooted in Scripture, Vatican II documents, Pope Paul's exhortation. I mentioned that. Corsillo literature and other spiritual reading. In short, in short, a Corsillo leader must be more of everything that a Corsillista should be. It's like what it's saying. And as Corsillo leaders, there will always be more to learn about oneself and our relationship to God, to one another, and to our family. We must be true to who we are and what we are. As far as the prayerful formation, since the purpose of the Corsillo movement is evangelization of environments, it stands to reason that this will only be accomplished by the laity who live in those environments that we are attempting to evangelize. Therefore, it is important for us leaders that we are attempting to evangelize the, for, in developing the Corsillo mentality to realize that our lay spirituality is a spirituality lived out in the world. In other words, ours is not a monastic type of spirituality. So, hindi tayo nagmomongha. We're not, you know, staying in a, we're not cloistered nuns or anything. I'm not saying that that kind of life is not a correct life. That's their um, ministry. But that's a different ministry than ours. So we're not that kind of a ministry. It's not a monastic type of spirituality. And, John, in chapter 7, in the Gospel, points this out very well when he said, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Vatican II says that our whole lifestyle and calling as laity is secular, and that means that we are called to live in the world and to be part of it. It asks specifically that lay persons who express their hope in the Kingdom of God and spend their days in the midst of the world and secular transactions should burn with the spirit of Christ and exercise their apostolate in the world as a kind of leaven. I have a document in here that you probably have seen before. 